Thank you very much. Um, so I come to this gathering from um, an English literature department. I don't know, maybe a couple of uh, the rest of you. I, what, what, what the hell am I doing here? Um, the, a part of the answer to that question is to be found in, in the fact that I see some of my work to be sure is talking about how we talk about dinosaurs, but also about how we use dinosaurs to talk to each other, um, how they become part of the language. Um, and I'll also say, uh, by way of introduction to this thing, uh, apart from that, um, is, that, uh, is, is, is that some of this paper turns on uh, the distinction between metaphor and, an, and analogy, which are two words that even English literary critics are sometimes inclined to use synonymously. Um, what's the difference between those two words? People spend their careers on this, but the best I can do in about 20 seconds um, is that um, if you are, if a, a metaphor is comparing two things in terms of material or spiritual kind, whereas analogy is operational. An analogy is something that works like something else, rather than is like something else. Um, any literary critics in the room who want to shoot me for being so simplistic about it, I'm very sorry, but that's, that's the best I can do in this time. We'll start with a clip. Um, pay close attention. There'll be a test afterwards. Pause it there. I think we get the idea. Um, or possibly, I hope we get the idea, anyway. Um, who's seen this film? The Good Dinosaur. Okay, that's, a, that's about right. So those, those of you who don't know it, it's, it came out last November. Um, <coughs> it is the most recent high-profile animated film about dinosaurs. And, and it's Pixar's first, um, which I think is, in, is important that this comes from the Pixar studio. It's also Pixar's first flop. Um, it, it lost about $50 million um, compared to Inside Out, which came out uh, within a few months of it and made about $856 million. Um, and... Um, uh, and, and Inside Out is currently a, a joint second on Pixar's 16 films on, on Metacritic. The Good Dinosaur is in 14th. And the two films beneath it are Cars 2 and Monsters University. For those of you who are interested in this. Despite this, I think, so, so there, is a, there is a tendency to regard The Good Dinosaur as not having worked. Um, and despite this, it makes for rewarding viewing, I think, not just for the occasional um, moments of genuine visual beauty, which are Pixar's hallmark, but also for the way in which it works with the imaginative figure of the social dinosaur. In numerous different guises, this figure, the social dinosaur, has ambled through popular consciousness since at least the Sydenham Crystal Palace exhibition of the early 1850s. And the social dinosaur is remarkable in my estimation for the breadth of cultural, scientific, and intellectual work which it has been asked to do, and for the meta many metamorphoses it has undertaken along the way. If dinosaurs can be, as the title of this panel su suggests, ways of thinking, then Pixar's film can be read as an attempt to think differently. Crucial in this reading is an understanding of the incredibly complex work being done with analogy, not only by Pixar, but by that more protean social dinosaur. Its impressive ability to move between cultural spheres comes about in part because it's a figure whose history is steeped in the mechanical comparison of bones, creatures, families, genres, epistemologies, and much besides. I shall say more about analogy in a moment. First, I want to illuminate just one of the good dinosaur's most diverting features and persuade you that this feature requires us to think carefully about the analogical work which this film is conducting. So... Why is the very first scene? Um, sorry, there's the good. There we go. Why is the very first scene? Here it is again, which has no direct bearing on any of the events of the plot, and which is never mentioned by any of the characters. Why is it there at all? Um, the good dinosaur, as you, this is what you gather from that, from that first sequence, is set in an alternative universe in which the KT impactor um, does not hit the earth. Free to evolve, undisrupted, the film tells us dinosaurs have developed arable farming. Um, and with them an agrarian society built around nuclear families. They also speak English, uh, generally in the broad accents of the southern USA. Significantly, the film does not tell us whether their ability to speak is interior or exterior to the text, by which I mean, is, is language evolved, thanks to the meteor's absence in those millions of years, or um, is it simply another example of the writerly device seen particularly, of course, in children's film and literature, which magically imbues animals with speech. 
The presence of the mere possibility of a quasi-empirical explanation for the animal speech, though, is intriguing. Without the opening shot of the asteroid missing Earth, we would happily ascribe the dinosaur language to artistic license and get on with our breakfasts. Its presence, though, raises questions which the film does not seem ready to answer about the way that its world works. Is it, in short, science, or is it magic? If the dinosaur's language is evolved, it stands alongside their technological and social developments as part of a charged analogy with humanity, suggesting not only that humans are like dinosaurs in some respects, standard anthropomorphism, but that evolutionary progress and human progress are coextensive ideas. If their language is a filmmaker's translation, on the other hand, we are left wondering which of the creatures undeniably human uh, sorry, which of the creatures other undeniably human-like characteristics, such as the hug shared by the main dinosaur family in the closing scene, which is for them extremely awkward physiologically, um, are the result of evolution and which of screen rhetoric. The situation is complicated by the fact that many animals remain deprived of speech. The film telegraphs to us the insanity of one minor character by showing him in one-way conversation with his voiceless pet bird, Debbie, but does not articulate the category difference which makes conversation with Debbie laughable while conversation with Arlo, the Apatosaurus protagonist, is mundane. This detail is one of many which admits as being read of, as, as symptomatic of the good dinosaurs' disorganized production history. And there was a, a change of directors about halfway through, um, which is usually blamed for this film's failure. I think that's uh, too easy. I want to suggest that here and elsewhere, the film is actively drawing our attention to the way in which it uses human language. Uh, it wants to foreground the issue, rather than as many other children's movies about animals have, to elide it. One of the ways in which this foregrounding occurs is through the film's relative scarcity of spoken dialogue, a characteristic which may be read in contrast with the original rejected story for the movie, which was reportedly deemed unacceptable in part because of too many extraneous characters. There was villages of people, uh, the producer Denise Reem says, and it was really convoluted. Arlo's journey through the absence of these villages puts him into conversation only with occasional bystanders, uh, whole scenes elapsing without any dialogue at all. And Pixar, of course, has a reputation for sequences free of spoken language, but here, the silences are less poignant than they are menacing. Arlo's is a dangerous world, and the film's principal antagonist, due to the largely transitory nature of the other characters, may be said to be nature itself, an inscrutable and, thanks to cutting-edge animation technology, volumetrically detailed threat with which no remonstrance is possible. Creating nature as, in the words of set supervisor David Mounier, the adversary for Arlo on his journey, further emphasizes the evolutionary mechanisms which the film supposedly has at its core. Despite the film's talk of great deeds, Arlo's main task in the story is simply, thank you, is simply to stay alive. You've got to get over your fear, uh, his father Henry tells him in the start, or you won't survive out here. This might help us to make sense of the film's title. It's never exactly clear what work that word good is supposed to do. The phrase doesn't occur in the dialogue of the film itself. Uh, the word dinosaur is also absent. Um, and um, nobody amongst the characters seems particularly interested in, in the subject of moral integrity. With an impersonal language-free nature as the adversary, though, it becomes possible to read the word good in the sense of evolutionary fitness. In an environment red in tooth and claw, sometimes jarringly so for a contemporary children's movie, Arlo becomes a representative for a particularly human teleology of progressive evolution. You're me and more, his father tells him. You're me and more. In this worldview, progress is inevitable, incremental, and pointing in a particular direction. Humanity. Um, we all know in this room, of course, that evolution does not point in any of those three directions. With much children's literature, we may safely refer to the anthropomorphic work done by animals as predominantly metaphorical. Animals stand in for humans. The interposition of a scientific scare quotes, plot line that may explain the human elements of the good dinosaurs' animals, however, operationalizes the comparison. Language rises inescapably to the foreground of a film which proposes not only that its dinosaurs might resemble humanity in certain ways, but that they must inevitably act as humanity has in order to achieve evolutionary success. Rather than a metaphor, in short, the film proposes an analogy. Activated by the unusually scientific conceit of its premise, this analogy underwrites the entire spirit of the movie, a good dinosaur, one with language, courage, tenacity, and tenderness, to say nothing of arable farming, is one who works in the same way as a good human 
Analogy has historical importance in understanding the real objects, fossil bones, without which the good dinosaur could not exist. Uh, Victorian naturalist Richard Owen, whom you all know, used the word analogy in a technical sense uh, to describe the relationship between anatomical features that work similarly in different species. The wings of a bat and those of an eagle, for instance, are analogous in that both allow flight. They are not homologous, however, as the wing of a bat is with a human hand, since the similarity is one of function and not of form. There is an invitation buried in Owen's useful distinction, I think. By maintaining a focus on use, as well as on appearance or substance, things superficially disparate might be drawn into fertile comparison. Those things might include, I suggest, the notionally estranged disciplines of literature and science, the rift between which has caused anxiety within and beyond the Academy since long before C.P. Snow's famous Two Cultures Lecture of 1959, One of the dangers inherent in a straightforward rejection of the dyadic conception of literature and science, though, is to be found in the temptation to homogenize, to claim explicitly or implicitly that there are simply no differences between the two. This sort of thing can irritate workers at the coalface of either discipline, who often and with considerable justification see numerous reasons for finding their work distinct from that of their colleagues in other departments. Analogy offers us a way around this problem. We don't have to say that something is like something, or identical to it, or indistinguishable from it, just that some aspect of it works in the same way. If that seems like splitting hairs, it's worth considering, and I self-consciously offer an analogy of my own here, the rhetorical success of this technique within the natural sciences. We don't regard the mastodon and the elephant as opposites, or as being at war with each other. We understand them as two different animals with certain mechanical properties in common and not others. Through use, then, analogy gives us access to a way of understanding similarities and differences without a necessary emphasis on conflict or incompatibility. And such comparisons can productively change how we see the entire world. Owen himself proved this when in 1842 he noted a novel characteristic shared exclusively by three different fossil animals, fusion of the sacral vertebrae, um, and argued on its basis for the recognition of a new order of fauna, the dinosauria. Now, the relationship Owen drew between Hylaeosaurus, Iguanodon, and Megalosaurus, the gesture which created the dinosaurs, proceeded from noticing, or more accurately, successfully convincing people of the existence of an analogy. Though these were three very different animals, the argument went, some important part of them worked the same. Crucial as this point is, it's equally important to note that Owen drew this understanding from a use of analogy and from background assumptions about how the natural world works, which would not be recognised by a biologist working today. A predecessor of Mendelian genetics and, moreover, a staunch opponent of Darwin, Owen simply did not have our familial understanding of species relationships available to him. Rather, he saw the diversity of vertebrate species as the variegated expression of a general and all-pervading polarizing force, that's Owen's words, uh, a force which, Nicholas Rutka tells us, produces repetition of parts and thus unity of organization. Where does Pixar's peculiar motion picture enter this discussion? The conceptual terrain which led Owen to coin the word dinosaur has changed almost out of recognition. Um, in uh, in, in the 160, 170 years since, but the concept of the dinosaur itself, the notion that Hylaeosaurus, Iguanodon, and Megalosaurus had something fundamental in common about the way they worked, has survived. It has done so against some fairly serious scientific objection, actually, uh, since the first two of these species are Ornithischians and the latter is a a Sauruscian, and the two orders are so different and so distantly related that many are given to wonder whether the existence of a category called dinosaur is scientifically useful. Good luck retiring it, though. Far beyond the realm of paleontology, the word has meaning, or rather meanings, for an extraordinary cross-section of people, most of whom seem unwilling to let go of it. With or without justification, John Wilford writes, Owen's dinosaurs survive as an ineradicable part of language. It seems these are hardy creatures, able to survive, indeed to thrive, in both public and scientific imaginations, after an almost complete substitution of authorising analogies that they have done so might tell us a little about an analogy and a lot about the good dinosaur. If they are indeed an ineradicable part of language, rather than simply the remnants of dead animals, then what is it exactly that dinosaurs can be used to say? The ostentatious removal of the KT impactor is a gesture which, in acknowledging a need for empirical explanation, throws a harsh spotlight on those elements of the film which do not admit of one. Such a gesture becomes more explicable if we understand it as a way of keeping the film's constructed nature at the front of our minds. 
Pixar's movies, after all, are always, uh, uh, excuse me, Pixar's movies, after all, always already advertise their artificiality by virtue of their dependence on computer imagery. And the detail and truth to life of their animation technology often supersedes the plots of their movies in the public eye. For all that, it is worth considering that the plot of this film is an attempt to prod at, at some of the same questions that CGI does. What is it that makes the human? that best defines an interaction with the lived environment, that transcends the mere likeness of a thing and becomes the thing itself. This constitutes a proper... Sorry, what is it that constitutes a proper set, a good set of principles by which to live? In the sharing of these questions, we can identify an analogy between the literature and science of, of this film, so to speak. The technology and the script of this film are very different things, but there is currency in the idea of a certain mechanical similarity between them. Even this very cursory exploration has necessitated trips into film and literary theory as well as the history of science and the brush with linguistics, and it's the potential of the dinosaur to provoke analogies across disciplinary lines, which I would like to be the take-home message from this paper. Although there are understandable reasons for its lack of success, The Good Dinosaur is a striking thing indeed, a film which appears to be deliberate in its attempts to push its viewer up against the different ways in which the dinosaur functions in popular culture as a symbol of genre, of technology, of the human and natural world. More than this, though, the film attempts to renegotiate some of those functions, using the dinosaur not only to tell a story, but to problematize that story. If we may say that the dinosaur, like anatomical homology and analogy in the assessment of Karl Kleisner, has outlasted all paradigmatic changes in the history of biological thought, then we must also admit that it is done so by a process of cultural adaptation and evolution, which is, yes, analogous with the biological processes into which the scientific objects of Owen's Natural History Museum gave such insight. The good dinosaur functions as an exciting and unusually self-conscious site upon which to witness this process in action, proof that what the dinosaur means is constantly up for debate. It proves, too, that this debate, like the dinosaur itself, is predicated on a sequence of analogies which pays little or no heed to the disciplinary divisions which seem to us instinctive. Approached this way, the dinosaur, good or otherwise, becomes a powerful tool for exploring the dense cultural relationships between literature and science. Thank you.